So I thought my company was going to have to go out of business today because I got here when the class was supposed to start, and there was only two of us here. We need to make every effort to get here on time. For one reason, you know, uh, if you if you decide to use me as a job reference, you're not use if you use me, if you put my name down there, you're not you're not getting a job reference from the college, you're getting a job reference from me, right? You understand? And uh, you know, I hate to say, well, when they call, say, well, you know, he passed the class, did real well, he just never showed up on time. What do you think the odds of you getting a job would be? Yeah. So I tell my students, if you think I'm going to give you a bad reference, don't use me as a job reference. So. so what was we talking about? Um, um, sensors, yeah, we were talking about sensors. And we were dealing with uh, limit switches, right? And, uh, which are proximity sensors, but we don't call them proximity sensors. We call them limit switches. And we went over there and I looked at the limit switches, tried to find them. Then we started talking about the magnetic sensors. Okay, I still didn't bring it over here. I got to find it. Oh, there it is. I'll have to power it up. Uh, the re-switches. We looked at optical encoders. Well, these use optics. I need to turn on my overhead projector. Right now. Keep forgetting what it is. I don't know if we can. Um, I don't know if I need any tools. It depends. Is uh, go and look at the encoders on the big panic over there. You know, those things are pretty impre impressive. Uh, they use incremental encoders. So most robots use incremental encoders, but they but they uh, they combine it with the counters, and these are inside the robot. So they have incremental encoder, they have the counters, and then the robots have batteries in them. So to the to the controller, it looks like an absolute encoder. So, okay, let's say for instance, you make a AZ robot that can pull some power to the No, no problem. As update, long as the batteries are okay. You have to update the register. Well, you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to unless little things happen. Uh, so. Uh, they have what they call a, uh, a a manufacturer's origin, which you would have to get, and this don't come with a robot. You have to get a special jig that you mount on the on the teach pin. I mean, on the on the flange, and then you move the robot and touch a certain place. Uh, most of them provide marks on the robot that you can match up, and it's going to get you closer than a millimeter. And that's usually probably 99.9% .9 of the time those are okay to set the origin on the robot. But also what you have to realize is that that's manufacturer's origin. That might not be the origin that you decide to use. Does that make sense? I think I told you about the, uh, the FANUC robot that we have up in the well shop. It's got a torch mounted on it. And if you, in uh, the, the origin for the FANUC robots is with, with it basically at a 90 degree angle. That's where the factory sets it. The problem is if you put that at a 90% angle, back, the back of the torch could actually hit the robot. So what Lincoln does is they set their origin down like this. But what they did is they put a secondary scribe mark on there so you can still line it up. Of course, we didn't know about that. I, did I tell you the story? Yeah. About it missing all the spots? Yeah. yeah. Because we use the factory, we use the factory origin, uh, the way to origin on the factory, and, and then, uh, and then, uh, Lincoln had set a different origin. 
Uh, some of them, uh, when we origin robots, we can do it um, manually by jogging the robot to predefined marks. But also, you can do it through entering, entering the information into a table. So you can do it. So a lot of your robots will, if you go over there and look at like the, uh, the KUKA and the ADB on the back of the robot, they have all these origin numbers on there. And you can go in and you can key in those origin numbers and you will get factor if you don't in change, if you, if you haven't changed any encoders. So if you're just lost your batteries or something like that, or for some freak reason it says you need to recalibrate it, then you can go in and key in those numbers and you will get the factory origin. As long as you don't want. If you hadn't changed out a servo motor or if you hadn't changed out an encoder. But, but what the, what the, uh, uh, what the robots do, and they call them absolute encoders, but they're actually what we call a battery backup absolute encoder. So they appear to be an absolute encoder, uh, to the, to the controller. And I, I can't get to my markers. I don't even see them. Go dud again. Duh. Yeah, so what we have is we have a, a sensor. It's, a, it's basically a through the beam. Y'all understand through the beam? Optical sensors, right? So what they have on the robot is they have a through the beam optical sensor. And then they have the encoder paddle coming in. Now they, uh, their encoders, they have a bunch of other information out here too. So they, it, it kind of looks like an absolute encoder, but if you look at the outside band, that's where the actual encoding takes place. And then the output of the encoder of uh, these counters, which would determine the resolution of that. And then, but what what we have in here is we have a set of batteries, and these are going to be inside the robot. And so what would happen is if you lose power to the robot and your battery's okay, then you're not going to lose your origin. But if your batteries are not okay, then you lose your origin. And I think it, I told y'all we lost the origin on the Mitsubishi because when they brought it over here, they didn't plug in the lines. And, uh, we lost the origin on the Fanuc, the lot, the small Fanuc. The large fanic was unplugged for, it took us a year to get that thing up and running. Well, it's because we just didn't have the time. At the time, we only had one 440 plug over there. And, uh, so what we, and the ABV runs off 440. So what we would have to do is we'd have to unplug the fanic so we could teach our robotics classes. And while we had it plugged up, we couldn't plug up the fanic. Uh, so when we finally got another uh, 440 pl uh, plug over there and another transformer, uh, then we was able uh, to get it going. And that's a, that's another story too. Uh, well, we finally got it going and it's been going ever since. Limit switches, and then we went into uh, read switches. Everybody okay there? We looked at the magnet read switches. Uh, and, uh, Hall effect. We talked about Hall effect, but uh, I've got some over here. I've got both types over here, by the way. I'll have to get my see if it's come apart and uh, get a power supply over here. And then we went over there and looked at them. Right, the magnetic sensor. Is everybody okay there? We try to find out where they was at. Uh, photoelectric sensors, and we use a lot of a lot of these. So what we have is have three basic categories or types of photoelectric sensors. Uh, we have what we call a diffuse sensor. So the blue is actually the object we're trying to detect. So what the fused sensor does is it ref it looks at reflected light. So when the light beam comes out of the transmitter, it hits the re it hits the object. And then when it creates that reflective light, that's what it looks for. Uh, now, what would be some of the problems with this? Huh? Well, 
This guy depends on reflective light. So even if I put my hand down there, that's going to be reflective light, right? You understand? So we're not blocking the beam. Or the fuse sensor, we don't block the beam. We depend on reflected light. So what it does is the beam comes out, it hits the object, and when it hot, uh, when it hits the object, it reflects back, right? You understand? So why is my shirt blue? Because it's reflecting blue, right? Y'all understand, right? Okay. So I don't know, because if it's green, we wouldn't know where to stop cutting grass at, right? How did I come back here? That was on a, there used to be a show called Night Court. And that was one of the questions he had, that somebody asked him why was the sky blue? Uh, he said because if it's green, we wouldn't know where to stop cutting the grass. So that's, that's not an original. So we're def depending on reflective light. Well, what's the problem? Distance would be a problem, right? You understand? What would other be? Color, the color of the object. So the further the blacks are going to reflect very little light, right? You understand? And then of course, whites are going to reflect a lot of light, right? You understand? Uh, it, and it depends on the color of the beam. If the beam's red, then red's going to reflect a lot of light, also, right? You understand? So the amount of light we get back is depending on what the color, right? You understand? So that's one problem. And, Sometimes that's an advantage, sometimes there's, that's not. So uh, what it gets back, you have to understand a lot of these sensors, what it gets back is actually an analog sensor. So this information coming back is going to be analog, right? You understand. But what they have inside this thing is they have a uh, analog to digital converter inside. So what we have is somewhere on that little sensor, we have a set screw. So we can set what we call the sensitivity, when it says it's true and when it says it's false. So we can set it so it ignores dark colors and sees bright colors. We can set it so it does see black, but it's going to have to be very close, right? For black, it's going to have to be pretty close. So the Festo line is a perfect example. Uh, it's got black sensor, it's got black ones, it's got a smaller bore, and then it's got the, the, the silver ones. And it's got the red ones that have a larger board. But what the robot does is when it drops down, depending on what piston it wants to put in there, depends on the color. Well, what the robot does, it's got a sensor on the side. And it drops down and look, it's adjusted so it don't see black. So that way, if it comes dropping down, it knows the cylinder's there because that diffuse sensor on that, on the, on the, on the jig there, it's adjusted so it sees everybody, so it knows it's something there, and when it looks at it, it don't see black, it knows it gets the small piston. The program knows it gets the small piston. If it does see a reflection, if you looked at the, if you looked at the red ones, and you looked at the, uh, the, uh, the metal ones, they all have the same board. So it don't know, it don't know it's red, it don't know it's bright, it's got metal on it. All it knows is that it, it, it sees reflected light. So what we can do with this diffuse sensor is we can literally adjust it so it sees, it has a threshold on the color that it wants to see, right? Does that make sense? So what does diffuse sensor dep depend on? It depends on reflective light. It's actually reflecting off the object itself. So here the transmitter and receiver would be in one unit. Uh, what's neat? What what's neat about the sensors they have on the uh, on the Festo line is that all the I like sensors are basically the same, and it depends on how they hook them up, right? You understand? Uh, so if you've got a transmitter and you've got a receiver, and then uh, what they do is they send that out through optical cable, and then our cable, our our sensing head is out here somewhere. And then what they'll do is they'll bring back the reflective light and bring it back into the other input. Uh, they'll come up here and they'll put a lens on here and use it by itself. Or they come up here and split it up and do uh, the next one. Well, the next one is what we call a retro reflector. A retro reflector. 
Now, what does the retroreflective do? It, it works basically like a through the beam, but you have one sensing element. Don't understand. So it shoots light out, hits that retroreflector, and then it bounces back. The ob So this guy would be true all the time, right? You understand, as long as it don't see anything. And then the object comes in and, and breaks the beam. It breaks the beam between the transmitter and the reflector. Now, what's a retroreflector? I think we talked about that. Yeah, it'll come back. It comes back at the angle. It'll, it'll come back at you, right? Now, what's the disadvantage of this? Well, this has been, this guy here has a range problem too, right? You understand? Because if your beam can only send light so far, then it's gotta, it's gotta make that back trip also, right? You understand? Now, the next one is what we call a through the beam. Some people call it a direct beam. Get more hits on it than anything. So here we have a transmitter and we have a receiver. We have two units, right? You understand that? And what happens is the object literally does what? Breaks the beam. So it's kind of like a diffuse, but what's nice about the uh, the uh, through the beam is it's got the longest range of any of these sensors. What some of the what some of the cons? What's that? Yeah, they got to be lined up exactly, right? Retro reflectors don't have to be lined up correct, uh, precisely. Uh, what would be the other problem? Yeah, we could use uh, we uh, a lot of times you'll see them use a diffuse sensor and a retro reflective is the same. It's just what you'll see is that they use that as a diffuse sensor. The range is going to be a lot less. If they use it as a retro reflector, the range is going to be greater. So if you take the sensors class, we'll use that one sensor for a diffuse sensor or we'll use it as a retro reflector. But what you'll find out if we use it as a diffuse, uh, your hand's going to be about this far. If you use it as a retro reflective, we run into a beam before it stops working. So, uh, and then we got it mounted on a panel, so there's really no, right now we can't tell the range. We might one day just take it off and set it out on the bench and see how far that thing works. But even though it appears to work a real long distance, a, 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 uh, through the beam would have a bigger distance. We had one out at US Steel. Uh, they, uh, the line crew uh, that did all the line maintenance out at U.S. Steel uh, over, uh, I guess it was toward Dolomite, they had a big, that's where they kept all their wire out there, the big old rolls of wire. Well, somebody got an idea, it had, it had a chain link fence down one side, and somebody got the idea, they went over and hooked a rope up to one of those big old spools ran it out that fence and they came out there at night and hooked it up to their car and pulled that whole roll out down that big old long road over there and they rolled it over to the side. Uh, then they would come out there every once in a while and cut chunks of it off and go and sell the copper on it. So I, I don't remember if they caught the guy or not. Uh, what we did is we went over and store, installed uh, one of these big old guys right there and it went probably a hundred yards. So we had a big, first of all, we put it down close to the ground and birds and squirrels would set it off. <laughs> and the police were going out there all the time. So we raised it up. It was about, uh, probably about two foot off the ground. And uh, we ran it down that whole length of that fence there. So if anybody came through, I mean, they, you couldn't see them, right? Cause they, yeah, they'd break it. Uh, and then we also came in and, uh, we didn't do it, but they came in and they ran a real thin wire down the fence, too. It was a really thin thing. And if they came in and broke that, they would set off their line. So we had that, and it was over. It was, good gracious, I don't remember how far it was. But it was a through the beam. It was real fun to adjust because you had to have headphones. You had to have walkie-talkies to 
do it because it was a he was a long way. So I know it well over probably two hundred yards. But that was this guy right here. But the problem is we had to keep it. We had to make sure it was a lot. Yeah, that was a line. So one guy would be on one end, we'd be on the other. We'd start adjusting it until it went true. And then, so it wasn't real hard. But... Uh, through the beam, we'll fix the over there and look at the lines on both lines and see if we can uh, we can find the retro reflective. We okay? Okay. And then of course the fuse. Uh, this is called an optical interrupter. It's another uh, variation of a through the beam. I think I got a couple of these. Uh, we show these guys a lot. So it's basically a through the beam sensor. Uh, but it's already set up for you. It has four wires coming out of the bottom. Two wires they call the E for emitter. You can see a little label on there. The other two wires are neutral. I think it's like the E for detector. Uh, yeah, I put a resistor outside of them. So actually, the uh, the uh, the detector is actually all this 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 right here. Oops. And then you get four wires coming out you get these two right here and these two right here so what you'll do is if you look real close you'll see a little plus uh sorry uh yeah you'll see a little plus up there somewhere you know so that tells you where the plus polarity to go and then you come up here and you put a resistor outside of it uh depending on what voltage you need so what you do is you, uh, you look at the state of the how much current this pulls, and then uh, what motion. So basically, what you do on the output, it's a little easier to calibrate uh, because when this guy here turns on, it drops to zero volt. So, you know, if you had, if it, if it, if it needed 15 milliamps and you did 20 volts, then you would just calculate a resistor that would drop 15 volts at 20 milliamps, and that's the. That's, so you could actually use any 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 voltage you wanted to. Over here, these guys, uh, these guys, you probably need to look at the data sheet, but if you don't, if you don't know what it does, uh, the generic is two volts. Two volts usually makes it work. So if you had 20, if you had 15 volts and you would calculate a resistor, that would drop what? 13 volts at whatever current that was required. So on these guys, you got to put these external resistors out there. But if you understand these things, you could you could run these things on any voltage that you wanted to. Uh, you could either you could even run them on AC, but you'd have to do a little trick. But what we do is whatever we want to detect would would come through this thing right here, right? You understand? So we could use these on optical encoders. Uh, we could use them on. Uh, uh, in fact, we got a setup. Uh, so I'm doing the PLC class, and we've got a motor with one of these optical encoders on it, and we're using one of these interrupters to, to work that way. Uh, the only problem with these is we couldn't tell the direction, right? Uh, and over here on the Amatrol line, we're using these uh, these uh, optical interrupters to actually sense the position on the robot on the right, that gantry robot on the right. So people think... Uh, Robots have to be programmed by, by computers, and that's not true. Robot, as long as they're reprogrammable, then they could be, and they do a task, then they could be considered to be a robot, right? So this is what we just showed y'all. So let's go over and find all these things. Questions on photoelectric sensors. Any questions? Pretty straightforward. Right. Okay. Are we okay?